monsters exist among us. They always have and perhaps always will. They have been man's timeless companions or competitors, perhaps endlessly vying for dominion over the earth. Make your choice of terms carefully, I pray you, and be guided by that which awaits you here. Blackwater Media presents The Creature Feature Anthology. A strange encounter happened to me last summer. I was driving home with a friend coming from the island. I was driving down Hugh Emerson Road that leads to Altoon Glor Boulevard. And as I passed the light, I and my buddy named George saw this hairy looking creature humanoid thing run fast across the road. I hit my brakes hard, I told my buddy to shine the flashlight I had in my truck out into the field, and we both saw it this huge, hairy, bipedal thing, this creature running off into the dark. After that, we drove out of the area and were trying to figure out just what the hell it was we saw. After a while, we both came to the same conclusion. We just had a run in with Bigfoot. My family and I were outside in an area near Lufkin, Texas when the space shuttle Columbia exploded. It shook the ground like an earthquake. And my theory is that the explosion somehow stirred up a creature that we call the man cat. It ran out of the forest after all the shaking. It was built like a panther, it had tan fur, but the damn thing stood up on two legs and ran off with incredible speed. I remember it had a massive wide head and a super long tail. Later on we had the game biologist come take a picture of its footprint and he said he's heard of similar sightings in the Angelina forest. That's not a comforting thought at all. Dr. Lester, I saw your recent post about the hat man. I had an encounter with this being in the late 80s when I was driving tractor trailer. I stopped to get some sleep on the steering wheel of the cab which, keep in mind, is about 12 feet off the ground. I felt like someone was looking at me so I lifted my head up off the steering wheel and looked out the driver's side window and he was staring at me. He couldn't have climbed up the side of my truck. He was wearing an old-fashioned tuxedo and a top hat. He was pure white, except his eyes were pure black. You're listening to the Blackwater Media Radio Network, the finest in digital audio entertainment. This is Blackwater Media coming to you from the great city of Atlanta. My aunt shared a story with me about something that she saw years ago, something that terrified her. It was in San Antonio, Texas around 1967 or 68. She was at the kitchen sink washing dishes and she even remembers that she was humming a song to herself. A 
Across the street from the house was a cemetery with a high fence. My father's buried in that cemetery, by the way. My aunt could see the cemetery gates from the kitchen window. On that particular evening, she looked out the window and saw five creatures standing along the cemetery fence. The creatures were basically human-sized bipedal felines and jet black. One of them was even leaning on the fence like a person would. She saw that the creatures were all looking directly at her. As if the creatures recognized the look of horror on her face, they appeared to break into a sinister laugh, one of them even covering its mouth, again as a person would. She ran out of the kitchen, and when she came back later, the cat creatures were gone. She never saw them again. About 20 years ago, I was driving south of an area called Three Rivers, between San Antonio and Corpus Christi, Texas. It was between midnight and 1 a.m. when something monstrous flew over the top of my car. A large, white, humanoid figure with wings. And no, it wasn't a damn crane, or goose, or swan, or any kind of bird or prey, or swamp gas but a humanoid figure with skin-like wings. Now I remember doing about 65 miles per hour and it came from the right rear and crossed my driving line at about 45 degrees, overtaking me in speed by maybe five to 10 miles per hour. Now as it crossed over me, it was only 10 or so feet above the roof of my car. Its wingspan was probably 12 to 15 feet and the skin was white. The wings looked to be constructed or shaped more like you'd expect to see in a bat or a pterodactyl, but with clearly defined human-type arms on the leading edge. There were also very definite, very clear-looking human-type legs trailing behind it, and the torso was built like a man. But because it came from behind, I didn't see a face. But looking back on it now, I'm goddamn glad I didn't. I'll never forget it as long as I live. After hearing some of the other creature feature stories, I thought I would share an experience that I had a few years back. I've always enjoyed fishing, and there are a number of ponds and lakes within a 10 mile or so radius of my home. During the summer, it's not unusual for me to go fishing two or three days a week. It was June of 2017, and I'd gone out to a nice little pond I knew about to catch bluegill. I remember it being a very pleasant day with only a few high, wispy clouds. Well, after about 30 minutes, I heard something rambling in the brush on the other side of the pond. Now behind the brush, there was a short stretch of woods, maybe an acre or so. I thought maybe a deer was over there rooting around. I decided to walk around to the area to see. I took about five steps when this very large black figure rose up out of the brush. This thing was a gigantic wolf standing up on two legs. I mean, this goddamn thing was seven to eight feet tall, including ears that had to be eight or nine inches. It had orangish, yellowish eyes, and it looked dead at me bearing these huge, sharp ass teeth with an expression of absolute malice. It let out a low growl 
then turned and paced off into the wooded area. Now, right before it got out of my sight, it dropped down to all four legs and walked away. Now, like I said, that was June of 2017. I still love fishing, of course, but that particular pond has been permanently scratched off my list. Sometimes in a person's life, there's an experience that is so frightening and traumatic that their entire concept of reality is changed, and so too is their view of their place in the larger order of things. In the mid-60s, my uncle was a deputy sheriff in a small town. Now, I don't want to reveal the location because of all of the self-styled investigators, thrill-seekers, and so-called adventurers out there just waiting to pounce. Anyway, he'd locked up a drifter who he'd caught in the process of trying to steal a car. The stranger had been ranting about having to get out of town before nightfall. He was sure that the guy was most likely stoned out of his mind. That night, my uncle was driving back to the station just off his rounds. He noted what a crystal clear night it was with the stars and an almost orange full moon lighting up the sky. He was only a block from the station when something impossible ran out in front of him. Some kind of creature. It had to be, but he recognized the blue shirt of the drifter. It was torn in three places. But the thing, hair covered its face. Its ears were long and pointed, and it flashed a mouth with insanely jagged pointed teeth. It stood there in the middle of the road, snarling. Not like an animal, but like a madman and illuminated by the police car headlights. My uncle jumped out of the car and got off two shots at it before it dashed off into the darkness. He was sure that he'd hit it, but it seemed unfazed aside from being jerked by the impact. He found the office in shambles and the cell door bars were bent wide open. He didn't know it at the time, but my uncle had an encounter with a werewolf and lived to tell the tale. My name is Wilson. I currently live in a small town in middle Georgia, and I want to let everybody know something. There's something weird in Harper's Pond down here. I know it because I've gone fishing there now for going on 10 years. You know, there's always stories, more like tall tales, local legends, and that kind of shit. I usually go along with it just for laughs and drinks. You know, the kind of yarns that the old women talk about while they're sitting out on the front porch peeling potatoes, or the shit talking that goes on with the old guy sitting around Hal's garage, or out front of the little rooster grocery store, smoking Lucky Strikes in Marlboro's. Anyway, Harper's Pond is really a lake. It's a little too big to be called a pond, but anyway, that's the name. But a couple of months ago, right about when the hot weather came in, I was out there fishing for bluegill in my boat. It's nothing fancy, it's just a rowboat. I was about three quarters out, close to the middle of the lake, but not totally. I saw something breaking the surface halfway between me and the bank. Whatever it was, was dark. Not black, but very dark. I could see at least five semi-triangular ridges protruding, and what looked to be a pointed tail. Although I couldn't see the entirety of whatever the hell this thing was, what I could see was at least as long as my 12-foot rowboat. I thought to myself, 
man, fuck this. And I paddled back to the dock and headed on down to Maury's for at least a double whiskey. Now, I can't tell you what that thing was. I can't tell you where it came from or how the hell it got into the lake. But I can tell you that by my reckoning, it's a monster. From now on, I'm steering clear of Harbor's Pond. If you're enjoying the show, go on over to blackwatermedia.net and join the Swamp Hunter Society. Just click on the Become a Member tab on the menu, and for only $4.99 a month, you can have exclusive access to the finest paranormal, horror, and supernatural story narration content available anywhere. It's the ultimate digital audio exploration into mystery, magic, monsters, and myth. Become a Blackwater Media Swamp Hunter Society member today. The experience I want to tell you about took place in Texas on June 20th, 2000, around 1 a.m. I just got off from work and was headed east. On this particular road, there's a 90 degree turn and at times you have to watch out because cattle might be out in that road. That morning, that's what I thought had happened. No one else was on the road, but I saw red eyes that would look at the truck lights and look down and back up and looked down over and over. So I quickly went from something's not right to what the fuck is going on here? Now keep in mind, I was on the left side of the road and when I got close, I noticed that this red-eyed creature stood about six and a half feet tall and had black hair all over its body. I stopped the truck, got out my spotlight and shined it on the creature. It seemed like forever, but I know that it was only a few minutes. The creature raised its arm above his head and let out a terrible scream that I know I've heard before. It turned around, dashed away, and disappeared behind a house. I've heard that sound before when I lived in Orange, Texas, just a few miles from that location. Now, I've traveled this road many times hoping to see this creature again and never have. I've been told this creature is similar to the Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest. My entire childhood, my father and I used to take late night walks due to his insomnia from working a late shift. Our neighborhood was considered very safe and ultimately was an urban neighborhood even though one of the roads towards the back of the neighborhood was lined with thick forests for about a mile and about a quarter deep which made a circle back on itself. All of these walks are very dear memories of mine except one and it ended up being the last one. Along the road with the tree line, there was a single street light to illuminate a small plot of land that someone owned, but was very overgrown and ill-kept. It was common for us to walk this road to enjoy the sounds of the forest, the lack of illumination, and the ease of circling back. One ordinary night, as we were walking and making conversation, 
my father abruptly stopped, pulled me close, put his hand over my mouth, and crouched down with me. He pointed toward a single illuminated plot roughly a hundred yards away. At first I didn't see anything and thought he was pulling my leg, but just as I began to protest his grasp, I saw a very small humanoid figure, roughly three feet in height, scrawny with long limbs, and seemed to be wearing some kind of weird overalls or bodysuit. It came out of the plot's brush line and cautiously took in its surrounding before signaling towards the brush. After a few seconds, two other small humanoid figures looking just like the first one materialized as well. After a few moments of what looked like a discussion, all three made a dash for the forest tree line. Once this happened, my father picked me up, threw me over his shoulder, and made a break for our home which was roughly a half mile back. Now keep in mind, my father was six foot five and about 220 pounds, and at the time I was roughly 120 pounds, and he never showed signs of slowing due to his fear and adrenaline. After that night, we never took late night walks. He installed four bright motion detection lights around our acre plot and brought home a dog. The few times I've tried to bring it up, he doesn't want to discuss it and made it clear he never wanted to. I think that that night, my father and I encountered alien beings. The image of them standing there huddled together is still very vivid after 15 years and it frightens me. Back in 1880, a former slave from a Georgia plantation called Old Sam, his name's been lost to history. It was said that he was starting to do okay for himself. He'd been working about 30 acres of his own for a few years and was looking to buy 10 more. But this was post-Reconstruction era Georgia, and Jim Crow was the social and political reality. Old Sam was falsely accused of stealing chickens and tobacco seed. And worst of all, of talking to a white woman while looking her in the eye. A few nights later, five men in robes and burlap hoods kicked in his door and pulled him from his bed at gunpoint. He was whipped on a post, beaten and kicked to near unconsciousness. It took five men to do this. They bound his hands and feet doused him with lamp oil, and then burned him alive in a hayloft. That was more than 100 years ago. But the ground could not hold his despair and anguish. It could not contain his stolen humanity. And so old Sam returned just a few weeks later to pay a call to five men. Not in vengeance, but to collect a debt and in exacting justice. His ancestors and their gods have very, very long memories. The Freedom Riders were civil rights activists who rode interstate buses in segregated southern states to challenge the non-enforcement of the Supreme Court rulings that segregated public buses were unconstitutional. In short, southern states ignored the court decisions in order to maintain segregation. My name is Richard and I'm proud to have been among the hundreds of young people to participate in that effort. On December 10th, 1961, we left the Atlanta Terminal Station on a Trailways bus bound for Albany, 183 miles to the south. Now, trust me, there wasn't a lot to see on those long stretches of Georgia Highway once we were out of Atlanta. But the bus was filled with laughter, conversation, and transistor radios radiating the sounds of Ray Charles and Jackie Wilson. 
Anyway, we stopped in Cordille, which was only a small smattering of buildings, houses, and farms along the highway. So by stopped, I mean the bus pulled into an abandoned lot, mostly overgrown with weeds, and the lot looked to have been a gas station at some point. It was a good opportunity for everyone to stretch their legs, enjoy sandwiches, coffee, Coca-Cola, and cigarettes. Fifteen minutes later, the bus driver, a guy named Mike, came barreling around the corner yelling for everyone to get back on the bus. My first thought was like, shit, did the clan show up out here? Because I knew for a fact that there were some brothers out here packing some firepower under their jackets. But there was just a brief moment of confusion. And again, Mike, the driver, reiterated in a much louder voice, get on the goddamn bus. And that was it. Everybody loaded onto the bus, still eating, sipping coffee, and smoking. Strangely, there wasn't too much made about why we had to get back on so fast, and it didn't take long for all the music and laughter to kick back up again. I can say this now because so many years have gone by. But a few miles down the road, Mike, our driver, took a fairly deep swig from his flask, and we kept rolling. When we pulled into Albany, I went up to ask him about what shook him up so much. He just looked at me, hesitated for a moment, and said, A damn huge-ass wolf ran across the road. And I was like, what? Man, there aren't that many wolves in Georgia, and aren't they mostly up in the mountains anyway? He said, no, 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 you don't understand. This motherfucker was running on two legs, and it had to be seven or eight feet tall. Of course, like I said, that was a long time ago. I know now that what he saw was the thing people call dog man. Man, there's some crazy shit in this world. And based on what Mike said he saw, I'm glad it was him and not me. I'm originally from Michigan, around the Metro Detroit area. This is the story my aunt told me and my cousins a couple of years ago. When she and my uncle first moved to Michigan more than 20 years ago, they decided to take a weekend getaway along with another two friends to go sightseeing at a lake in northern Michigan. Now, she doesn't remember exactly how everything happened then, but told us that they encountered a pack of wolves and they had to retreat back into their car. What they noticed right off was that one of the wolves was exceptionally large, like large like a cow. That's the way she put it. She said it had black fur and a very mean looking face. And then, holy shit, this damn thing stood up on two legs and it was a moment of sheer terror. Now, the other wolves remained on all fours and moved to surround their car, growling and howling the whole time. It must have scared the shit out of all of them. At that moment, my uncle was like, it's time for us to get the hell out of here before that one on two legs makes a move. He hit the gas, hauled ass down the road, and hit the main highway. This is a little story to keep in mind if you're ever near the upper peninsula of Michigan and the Isle Royal National Park. I left home before sunrise on my way to spend the Thanksgiving holidays with my parents. Just two or three days of reminiscing food, drinks, and of course, football. I'd gotten a good ways down the highway and turned onto old Black Rock Road, which I knew would add an extra 20 minutes or so to the drive, but I couldn't resist the scenery of the farmland, the old barns, grazing horses and cattle, all of the things that registered in my memory bank of golden childhood memories. 
my dashboard clock read 7.20 a.m. But then, as I rounded the bend in the road, all of those hazy, fond boyhood remembrances crashed. Out ahead of my car, maybe 30 yards away and about 50 feet up in the air, was a, and I have to keep it real here, a UFO. I mean, this damn thing was just hovering there, the classic flying saucer, like in some Saturday afternoon science fiction movie. Silvery, metallic looking, disc shaped, yellow, blue and red lights rotating in a clockwise fashion. Now, I didn't get out of the car, but I let my window down and I could hear a very faint hum, very faint. Then it shot off, not straight up, but away from my position to the south and disappeared over a hillside about half a mile away. My dashboard clock now read, 8.30 a.m. What the fuck? The whole sighting couldn't have been more than five minutes. How the hell did I lose an hour and ten minutes? I remember sitting there thinking to myself, God damn. I just saw a UFO. Close up, clear as a bell, hovering right in front of me, and saw it fly off. It wasn't Venus. It wasn't a flock of geese or temperature inversion or any of that other silly dismissive bullshit. And oh yeah, it wasn't swamp gas. It was July 19th, 2016. I remember the date because we had our annual Christmas in July at my in-laws. And it was a crazy full moon. We left to head home. We took the back way. And we live in a somewhat rural area. So the back way is very dark. No traffic at that time of night. And we were going about 65 miles per hour. Now, as we're driving along, about five minutes from home, out of the corner of my eye towards the forest on the passenger side, I catch a glimpse of something moving fast. The moment my foot hit the brakes, my wife's hand grabs my leg. I'm getting goosebumps as I'm saying this now, but it was one goddamn crazy experience. We came to a screeching halt in the road and whatever it was stopped dead in front of us. It cocked his head and looked at us. And we both said at the same time, did you see that? And it was huge. It was easily seven feet tall, had yellow eyes that glowed from the headlights, and it had wolf-like features. It was crazy muscular, but also kind of thin at the same time. The most memorable feature though, were its legs. It 100% looked like a dog walking upright with a cocked angle in its leg. I think they're called hawks. No sooner did it stop and glare at us, did it continue to bolt across the road and vanish into the forest on the driver's side. The only way we've ever been able to describe it is being werewolf-like. And like I said, my wife and I both agreed. Now, if it'd just been me, I would have assumed I was crazy and never mentioned this to anybody. But to hell with all the woulda, coulda, shoulda bullshit. Bottom line, it was a dog man. Anytime someone tries to ask us if we're sure about what happened, we just look at them and say, we both saw it. 